So I had a, I had a really weird, pretty cool experience this week. Uh, I don't know if I was in bed or, or what, but I was just really feeling the Holy Spirit move in me. And it, it was kind of convicting me and saying, Steve, get back in the game. You know, let's however many days in, 10, 15 days in, and the Holy Spirit's like, all right, I want you to do this right. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I get up and I go downstairs, get on the computer, and I'm counting the days to Easter from the day the Holy Spirit told it to me, which is just a couple days ago. And uh, I counted the days and it's like 33 days. I'm like, wow, that's so cool. When I was in high school, 33 was my number. It's my luckiest number ever. And so that's cool. And when I was in seminary, I did a 33-day devotion to the Blessed Mother, the St. Louis de Montfort devotion for those who have ever done it. And so it was a 30-day. We counted from Immaculate Conception. We counted back 33 days. And we, we did that devotion. I'm like, all right, I'm in. I'm going to do a 33-day devotion to the Holy Spirit. That's the rest of my life. 33-day devotion to the Holy Spirit. So this is probably like day 31. So uh, I'm only two days in. But uh, yeah, the move of the Holy Spirit in us. And so uh, I was sharing with um, I was sharing with a young man. We were really doing a lot of discernment, and I was trying to help him because he had so much information, so much feeling, so much uh, different mixed intentions and wants and desires, and just everything. So much has gone on already that I gave him a tool to use to help him just sort it all out to make it kind of obvious to him. So you know. You, it really touches five areas of our life. I uh, said, so just write down everything that goes in each area, like your senses, what you sense, the five senses, all your thoughts, all your intuitions, all your rationality, what you're thinking about this. Then go to feelings and write down all your feelings. Then go to wants, everything you want, all your desires. Then go to all the actions that have happened. And just write all that down. You have paid for each of those and you did it. And he came back and he had something that uh, he was saying it was feeling. So I'm like, that's not a feeling. What was that? And he was like, well, I, I feel like God is, or I feel that God is doing this. And I realized God didn't fit in any of those categories. God wasn't a thought or an emotion or, or just, you know, something, one of our senses. So I said, no wonder you're saying feeling because it's not a sense. I think that's a sixth sense. It's that God speaking to us, the Holy Spirit speaking in us, and you're hearing, but not with your ears, you're hearing, you know, with your heart, with your soul. And so uh, that was pretty cool that uh, he was, listen, God was speaking in him and moving in him, and he was not knowing where to put that on the awareness wheel because it was altogether different. It was in the soul. It was something that didn't fit that human awareness. So that was fun. Uh, I, that was not the Holy Spirit. You need discernment. <laughs> so the first thing, our title is, how can we foster inspiration to the Holy Spirit in us? What can we do to make those inspirations of the Holy Spirit work in us. I was listening to the words of the song, and it was like, Spirit move, uh, or what would it say, Spirit speak, uh, Spirit move, as only you can do. Uh, we want more of you, and then Spirit fill this room, as only you can do, we want more of you. So Spirit speak and Spirit move, as only you can do. If the Holy Spirit does that in your life, speaks, moves, will you be able to hear it? Or will it just blow right by us? You know, if the Holy Spirit's moving deep within our soul, are you picking up on that? Are you able to uh, sense that and really hear that? Or is it just blowing by us? And so how can we foster inspirations? And then how can we hear those? How can we listen to what God is doing in our life? And so that's, that's kind of the title. My first slide, probably, that I want to share is God loves everyone with a unique love. And he wants to lead them all to perfection. 
But at the same time, he has different paths for different people. We talked about this last time. Remember that? God loves everyone with a unique love. And God wants to lead everyone in a unique way. Uh, Daniel was telling me, he was talking to Mary. I asked if I could share this. She said, yeah. She said, oh, that explains a lot. I can't wait till next week. I don't know if it was a couple years ago or whatever. God was moving in her and speaking to her and telling her to do something in particular, a particular thing, a devotion. And she looked at it when she was done and she's like, no, that's just way different than everyone else. And she didn't do it. She's like, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's not like anything anyone else is doing. And then when she heard the talk, she's like, oh my gosh, that was God leading me in a unique way to do a unique thing. And she said, actually, when I'm following God, it's way easier. And <laughs> it's way better and way easier. And so God's doing a new, unique word, a work in you. St. Francis de Sales says, those who keep their hearts open to holy inspiration." Are happy. Yeah. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who are able to hear the Holy Spirit because it's not a commotion in here. And that's what really keeps us from hearing the Holy Spirit, isn't it? There's just so much going on here, here, and out here that how could we ever hear when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us? So St. Francis de Sales says if we don't resist God's grace. He gives each of us the inspiration we need to live, act, and maintain ourselves in the spiritual life. So God does this. And this, this is probably one of the important ones I want to say today. These motions of the Spirit, even though, unfortunately, they have a little place in the lives of many Christians, are not something exceptional in themselves but they form a part of the normal functioning of the spiritual life. So God's not asking you in the school of the Holy Spirit here in this retreat to go above and beyond, to, to really soar, to go way beyond what the normal Christian would do. God's asking you to be a normal Christian and to do these things that God does uh, that are not exceptional in and of themselves. So St. Paul, in the book of Romans, uh, it's chapter 8 if you want to look it up, uh, verse 14, says, those who are led by the Spirit of God, those people are the sons of God. And in uh, your case, if you're a woman, daughters of God, all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. You are the children of God. But how do we know how to be led by the Holy Spirit? That's what, how this whole talk is all about. Paul says in Galatians, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. What does that mean? That's been there all along. We've always known that, and now we want to do it. I'm going to skip the quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. Well, let's just say it real quick. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, he says, render all the faculties of the soul capable of submitting to the motions of God. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit mean that everything about the soul is capable of them picking up the motions that God's doing in our life. So every Christian then, and this is maybe, put this on your to-do list, write this down, here's what I'm going to do. Every Christian should desire and pray for these inspirations of grace. Inspirations are not an optional extra in the spiritual life. So now what specifically will enable inspirations of grace to take place in us? Are you ready? Are you excited? You want to know these things? Uh, how many people, when <laughs> Daniel was saying, okay, let's just stop for a minute and pray. I was starting to walk up the aisle and I stopped and I just silenced myself. And he says, let's just listen to God. How many people, when you just stopped and listened to God, were, you don't have to raise your hands because I don't want anyone to look good or bad. Uh, <laughs> how many people really were in God's presence or really feeling a beautiful presence of God? Because uh, I was. And uh, how many people who were feeling that <coughs> didn't want to hear the talk? They just wanted to stay in that beautiful presence of God. I did. <laughs> because what God was doing in us and how God moves in us and speaks in us, that's true. That's eternal. That lasts forever. All these other things are, are wonderful, but they pass away. Uh, so, number one, what can we specifically do? And this is why if 
if you were in the room eating dinner or, or at a table in the back, and I said, okay, time to, time to be together is over, let's, let's come and praise. Look at the number one thing Father uh, Jacques Philippe says you can do to foster inspirations and to be able to pick up on the, the God speaking in us and moving in us. Practice praise and thanksgiving. If you practice praise and thanksgiving, your heart is going to be capacitated for the movements of the Holy Spirit. And what draws down most graces from our dear Lord is gratitude. For if we thank Him for a gift, He is touched and hastens to give us ten more. And if we thank Him again with the same sincerity, what an incalculable multiplication of graces. I don't know what kind of math she was doing, whether she got ten more or it was ten times ten, or if she just squared it. But uh, when these graces fall on us and we say, thank you, Lord, God's touched and he gives us multiple incalculable more. That's St. Therese of the Sioux. So number one, practice praise and thanksgiving. It's not the preliminaries. It's not warming us up. It's not something to go use the restroom while we do that. Oh, I'll go to the bathroom, we're just singing. No, we're doing the number one thing that will capacitate our soul for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Number two, desire inspirations of the Holy Spirit and ask for them. We must, of course, desire God's inspiration and ask for them frequently. That's why Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. When Jesus said that, ask and it will be given to you, what was he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Exactly right. Uh, and so we are to ask for those inspirations of the Holy Spirit. I put a lot of asterisks on this one. And so maybe this is one of those, we should do this thing, write it down as another thing to do. One of the petitions we make to God most often should be, inspire me in all my decisions and never let me neglect any of your inspirations. Yeah. That's what we're asking God. Inspire me in all my decisions. Never let me neglect any of your inspirations. There's a, there's a quote by uh, St. Therese of the Sioux. It's, it's coming up. I don't want to spoil the paper. Uh, three, resolve to refuse God nothing. Whatever God's doing, do it. However God moves in you, do it. We should have a strong, constant determination to obey God in everything, big or little, without exception. Whenever God moves, any spiritual director who's ever directed me said, just immediately, move with the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit moves, just go that way. So we should be clear that this determination to obey God in everything, you scrupulous people, listen up now should not become a scruple that the devil could use to discourage us. In this area, as in everything, we should let ourselves be led by love and not by fear. So, just determine to obey God, but don't be scrupulous about it. Be loving about it. Just be crazy in love with God. Francis de Sales says we should love obeying more than we fear disobeying. All right? so get rid of the scrupulosity, get rid of the fear of disobeying, and just really rejoice in the movements of that. So, I wrote a note here. Thank you. Number four, practice filial and trusting obedience. Filial just means us, okay? We're brothers, we're sisters. So be obedient to your brothers and sisters when they, when they uh, are with us and in, in our uh, conversations. It says, of course, we must obey God rather than men, but it would be an illusion to think we were capable of obeying God if we're incapable of obeying other people. The reason for this is that the same obstacle has to be overcome in both cases. Isn't that kind of cool to know. The obstacle to me obeying God is the same obstacle to me having an obedience with you as you speak into my life. And 
So, attachment to me, me having attachment to me and to my will, if, if we can, that's the problem to overcome. If, if, uh, if we're to obey God, if we're to obey other people, it's, the problem is I'm attached to me, I'm attached to my own will. If we can only obey a, a people when it happens to please us, we're fooling ourselves about being able to obey the Holy Spirit. You know what's really cool about obedience? This is one of my notes, but uh, one of the reasons I love obedience so much, it just, it just does away with the ego. It's like, whatever I wanted, I don't have to have. And whatever I wanted, it was the ego that wanted it. It wasn't my soul. Um, I, went to, I went to Starbucks uh, twice in a row, uh, yesterday and today. And both times I went, yesterday I went, and there's a long line at the drive-thru. So I'm in this long line, and I'm like, okay, God, I'm thinking this is you. And so I'm not going to grumble, grumble or complain or anything. So, so I'm like watching in my mirror. Is anyone getting behind me? No. I get up and I order. Anyone behind me? No. I get up and pay. Is anyone behind me? No. I drive off, the whole place is empty. And I'm like, okay, okay, God, I'm listening. So I go this morning, uh, I told Cindy, I said, Cindy, don't forget my coffee beans. I got them at work. And between Cindy and I, <laughs> we didn't forget our heads if they weren't attached. But uh, we both, we forgot them. So I ran to Starbucks this morning with the dogs. They love to go for a ride. And I, uh, I get to Starbucks. It's like six something. And there's a long line at the drive <laughs> My God, I get it, I get it, I get it. Don't desire long lines, don't desire short lines, don't desire anything. Just be happy to be here. I get it. I'm just happy to be here. So that's the soul. The soul is just wants to be here, wherever here is. The soul, when we're at Starbucks, just says, yeah, I'm just, I just want to be a Starbucks. When you're a Holy Redeemer, I just want to be a Holy Redeemer. You know, wherever it is, the soul is just happy to be alive, happy to be in God's uh, grace, happy to uh, be, be in union with the Holy Spirit, with people and love and all that sort of thing. It's my ego that wants the short time. Right? So God keeps trying to work on that. Don't want a short line, don't want a long line, don't want health, don't want sickness, don't want long life, don't want short life. Don't desire any of these things. Life's the gift, love's the point, and so, um, uh, anyways, I kept my eye on that rear view this morning, too. No one got behind me. <laughs> I drive away, and I think Starbucks is empty, it's dark. And I'm like, I got it, God. I do not desire long lines, short lines, red lights, green lights, nothing. Just, so. By practice, abandon. Abandon. What does that mean? So, how I put it was, uh, I know how the book put it, is obedience to abundance. Whatever happens, the soul's, the soul's good with that. It's the ego that's not so good with that. And so we're not being asked to consent to evil if evil happens, but to consent to the mysterious wisdom of God who does permit evil. This form of obedience is very painful, but very fruitful, very fruitful. So, and we can work absolutely for good in the world. We can work to change our world, absolutely. We're called to do that. We're called to transform our whole world. But um, as things happen, just to accept those with an obedience and say, God, your will be done. And this really, really speaks to me. I don't know why this one really speaks to me. Probably just because of long lines at Starbucks, but after we've done everything in our power, we're invited, faced with what is still imposed on our will by events, to practice an attitude of abandonment and filial trust towards our Heavenly Father, in the faith that for those who love God, everything works together for good. Romans 8, 28. For those who love God, Everything works together for good. God, thy will be done. I, I told you that story about the woman who was in the kayak, 
and she went, went off the waterfall and her kayak just stuck like a, like a pin in these rocks. And, and she's like trying to get her kayak out, she couldn't, she's underwater. She tried to get herself out of the kayak and she couldn't. And she realized, all right, my greatest fear is gonna happen. My greatest fear was drowning, I'm gonna drown to death. And she did. And as she was drowning, she just said, God, I will be done. I will be done. She said, I meant it for the first time in my life. I prayed it a million times that our Father in heaven, I will be done. And Jesus just wrapped her in his arms and said, it's going to be okay. And she said, what about me? Because your kids are going to be okay. And she uh, ended up going to heaven. She didn't want to come back. God sent her back. And she's like, no, it's from how people talk to God, isn't it? To hear how he can talk about it. He's kind of he said, God said, you need to work on priorities. He said, I don't have to <laughs> How'd that argument go? <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, I was like, hey, you got to go back. You don't get to stay here. And she goes, uh, first of all, I'm not going back. And second of all, you can't make me. <laughs> and then she came back. Uh, but, um, yes, I will be done. Even if I'm under a waterfall, I'm be done. it'll be okay, Jesus said. I think we don't hear that enough. I need to be, we just have to tell everybody all the time, even ourselves mostly, it'll be okay. Everything's going to be okay. We're in God's hands. Jesus has us wrapped in his arms. It will be okay. So, uh, if we always rebel and tense ourselves against difficulties, that kind of defiance of God will make it difficult for the Holy Spirit to guide our lives. We won't be able to hear the Holy Spirit if we're always rebelling against what's going on in our lives. That's important. If you're rebelling about what's going on in your life, you won't be able to hear the Holy Spirit. And you're not the exception. Uh, you're just going to be completely distracted. Here's my favorite quote of all. Best quote ever. Better take a picture of this one. St. Therese of Lisieux, as a child, in talking about all these things that go on in our life, good and bad and all that kind of thing, says, I choose it all. Yeah, I think that's what God's looking for in our hearts. Whatever God you're bringing our way, I choose it all. Whatever you're doing, yeah, I choose it all. Good, bad, happy, sad. I get that you're in control and everything will be okay. So externally, it doesn't change anything. Our situation is going to still be bad, but interiorly, it changes everything. It changes us in a way to where we can be led by the Holy Spirit. So, six. Practice detachment. Watch my clock. Oh no, my alarm's going off in two minutes. Practice detachment. We cannot receive the motions of the Holy Spirit if we're rigidly attached to our possessions, our ideas, or our point of view. And that doesn't mean we're going to say the hell with it all, or become indifferent to everything, or practice this sort of forced asceticism, stripping ourselves of everything that makes our life. Here's what it does mean. We need to keep our hearts in an attitude of detachment, maintaining a sort of freedom. That's what it is. Detachment is freedom. It's a distance. It's an inner reserve that will mean that if some particular thing or habit or relationship or personal plan is taken from us, we don't make a drama out of being deprived. It's like, God, thy will be done. All my trust is in you, Lord. I believe you're in control of everything. I'm going to work for the good in the world, but I'm going to trust whatever you bring my way. So here's a big point. We are sometimes far more hampered in our spiritual progress by attachment to our own ideas, points of view, and ways of doing things. So what happens, I'm going to skip one of these comments and I'm going to say, uh, when our goals are aiming at something excellent to themselves, you know, we get attached to our own wisdom. Because all I want is this good thing. So maybe a seriously bad obstacle in the way of facility to the Holy Spirit. So let me read that again. Even when the goals we're aiming at are excellent in themselves, 
attachment to our own wisdom may be a seriously bad obstacle. I'm kind of I'm kind of honored to be Maybe attachment to our own wisdom may be a seriously bad obstacle in the way of docility to the Holy Spirit. Such an obstacle is all the greater in that this kind of attachment often goes unnoticed because it's obviously easier to be unaware that we are attached to our own will when what we want is the good in our own self. Since the object we're aiming at is good, we feel justified in wanting it with a stubbornness that binds us. And so, I'll skip ahead and uh, just read the I got a bunch of asterisks by. Number seven, practice silence and peace. In this one I have three asterisks by. It says, if our inner world is noisy and agitated, the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit will find it very difficult to be heard. Yeah, we're going to end up being like upset. We, we want to keep a peaceful heart in all circumstances. Silence is not an empty silence. It's a peace, an attentiveness to God's presence, an attentiveness to others, a waiting in trust and hope in God. Our world, though, is like this. We sometimes let ourselves be overtaken by ceaseless whirlwinds of thoughts imagination and words that we've heard or said. And all this moving feeds our worries, fears, and frustrations, and obviously leaves the Holy Spirit little chance of making himself heard. Eight, persevere faithfully in prayer. Goes without saying, make a place in your heart for the Holy Spirit. And nine, examine the movements of your heart. There's a lot of movements in your heart, it could be the devil, it could be the Holy Spirit, or it could be just our own disordered movements. Our disordered movements, those are motivated by fear, resentment, anger, aggressiveness, the need to be noticed or admired by others, sensuality, wounds, and so on. And so the move of the Holy Spirit, we want to be able to begin to speak that language. So we can always know when it's the Holy Spirit who's moving and speaking. I hope this this was a really, really practical teaching today. It's really like the Holy Spirit's definitely what we want. We want God to speak in us and to move in us, but we want to be able to hear it and to know it and to follow it and to live it out. And I hope that these, in this chapter of the book, if you have the book, you can reread them. And just live, pay attention to the ones you think you need to follow the most uh, or listen to the most. Uh, I found some that really spoke to me and I wanted to work on those. Uh, some that I felt like I was doing easily. For me, I don't need to hear praise and thanksgiving. I, I do that all the time. I feel. Uh, but I didn't need to hear accepting being obedient to the events in my life or just saying that I will be done. Uh, it'll be okay. I trust completely in you. I'll work for good. 